short presentations about yourself that you sent to us. You, I think so. But I don't think we do. Details about you to introduce you to the audience. And then, yeah. It's recording now. Okay. Keep it down. For sure. Okay, we're about to start. You can also sit on the front if you don't have enough space on the in the corner there. All right, so welcome everybody. We are very uh, happy to have you here for this uh, other exciting session uh, within our uh, se like seminar series in development studies. We are also very honored to have Professor Michelle Williams and Dr. Vishvash uh, Satgar that came all the way from South Africa for us. So please wor welcome them properly. Um, uh, they will be talking about transformative politics and the solidarity economy. Uh, they will discuss in particular about uh, a very hot topic, like emancipatory alternatives to capitalism and uh, whether solidarity, the solidarity economy can actually represent a proper path to transformative politics. This talk draws on a book they're currently working on, which is based on six years of fieldwork uh, across 13 countries, uh, where a project where they have worked on, like to study on worker cooperatives, worker cooperative led economic networks and um, try to develop a new theoretical approach to transformative politics. Uh, Michelle's uh, <coughs> work relates to <coughs> social movements and alternative economic political systems. She has worked on a comparison uh, <coughs> in between uh, India and South Africa, India on the state of Kerala. In her book, uh, The Roots of Participatory Democracy, she has provided a comparison of the role of solidarity economies, labor and social movements in these two countries. She uh, was member of the Center for Indian Studies in Africa in between uh, 2007 and 2011, and is uh, now also the chairperson for the Global Labor University Program in South Africa at the University of Witwatersrand, where she is also a senior lecturer. Vishbas is currently the executive director of the Cooperative and Policy Alternative and also a senior lecturer at the University <coughs> of Witwatersrand. He has worked for three decades on grassroo as grassroots activists in South Africa, uh, focusing on a wide range of issues, including the improvement of township communities, food sovereignty campaigns, and campaigns around climate, uh, jobs, and popular democracy in South Africa. Uh, their talk will last about 40-45 uh, minutes, then we will have plenty of time for a discussion, so we welcome uh, your questions and we really hope you will engage with their, with their talk. Just a few reminders before we start. <clears throat> if you haven't attended our uh, seminars before, in case you want to tweet, our hashtags are <clears throat> SOAS Dev Studies and ESRC. Uh, for your information, there is someone taking pictures that will be posted on our website. Uh, there will also be a sign-up sheet, I think, or, yes, there. And uh, uh, the talk will be followed by a short reception in the staff common room upstairs. You're all welcome. Please. Okay. So this is the 
is there a microphone here? No. So, can you hear me? I, okay. Um, all right, first let me just say thank you. Is that better? All right, is that better? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, okay, first, thanks very much. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to be speaking at SOAS, um, and particular thanks to Alfredo and Faisy who invited us and organized and dealt with logistics, and we really appreciate um, the generosity and um, nature in which they did it. So thanks very much to them and to SOAS, and Vish and I are delighted to be in London. Not sure we're delighted to be here in winter, though I hear it's a mild winter, but we're coming from sunny South Africa right now, so we're um, freezing a bit. But we're delighted to be here. Um, we've divided the talk into two parts. The title of the talk um, is Transformative Politics and the Solidarity Economy. And basically, the, the building blocks of the solidarity economy are worker cooperatives. So in the first part of the talk, I'm going to discuss worker cooperatives, and then Vish is going to cascade up from this and talk about solidarity economies and transformative politics. I want to stress that um, our theoretical thinking is in deep conversations with our empirical work. Um, the empirical work comes out of six years of field work in 15 different countries where we did over 300 interviews and have visited over 100 cooperatives, worker-owned factories, and worker-owned enterprises of various types. Um, we are currently, in, and we stopped, well, we're hoping we've stopped the research stage um, in November last year, 2015, but um, as most of you know, research seems to go on and on. Um, but we're supposed to be writing, we're, we're, we have a publisher willing to publish our book, so we really have incentive to get it written. And we're in the process of writing. This is the first time we're speaking about it publicly, so we really welcome feedback, questions, you know, um, engagement that will help us push our thinking further. Okay, in the first part of this um, talk, I'm going to go over worker cooperatives. And I'm going to um, first talk about just what are worker cooperatives, and then some of the exciting um, rethinking going on around worker cooperatives, and then look, um, give you a few empirical examples of what I'm talking about in the theoretical sections. Um, cooperatives have figured very prominently in the left imaginations for over 150 years. Um, today, however, worker cooperatives are not just defensive struggles against capitalism, but what we're finding is that they're also prefigurative moments that lay the basis for a future egalitarian society based on democratic social organization. So we are rethinking worker control using ideas of power, um, the idea of the commons, of democratic self-management, and linkages with communities. Okay, so first, what are worker cooperatives? The most basic characteristic of a worker cooperative is the transformation of work at the point of production. So there are four, there's four main features of a worker cooperative, and the first is that they meet member needs. This is one of the things that they usually have in their constitution. It's a primary definition. They meet member needs. The second is that they practice direct democracy at the workplace in which worker owners democratically make decisions based on one person, one vote. So not on shares, not on um, power, not on your place in the hierarchy, but one person, one vote. Three, workers collectively own the means of production, um, whether it's a factory, a farm, a bakery, or any other enterprise, ownership. And there's, it's interesting, there's been some experimentation with ownership, but historically, collective ownership of the means of production has been a defining feature. And fourth, that workers, co worker owners collectively decide how surplus is distributed and how losses are managed. So in all the key features, there's collective democratic decision making. So the idea of worker cooperatives is that they challenge capital's structural point, uh, structural power at the point of production. They, they challenge structural power through their economic activity. And they also challenge our notions of labor beyond a wage earner, but who, a wage earner who bargains over the price and conditions of work. And they do this by changing the way, the way in which work is organized and owned at the point of production. So this has been, the, been vital and a hallmark of worker cooperatives. And today's worker cooperatives, though, are taking this further. So what we're finding in the rethinking of worker cooperatives today is that we have seen over the last few decades a new ethos and wider practices beyond the shop floor. 
worker cooperatives today are not just looking to change the point of production. They are still doing this, and it's, it's obviously still crucial to them. But they are also transforming the wider social relations in which their en enterprises are embedded. They are sinking linkages to other enterprises, communities, and social movements, and not just cooperative social movement, uh, cooperative movements. There's, they're looking to other movements as well. And they're doing this in an effort to create alternative economies, in which we are calling the solidarity economies. So worker cooperatives still operate on principles of, and values of collective ownership, Though, as I said, they've experimented with this to, from state ownership, social ownership, worker ownership, community ownership. So they've kind of exper experimented beyond just worker ownership, but there's still collective ownership of some sort. Um, they still practice one member, one vote, deliberative and democratic decision making, but now they also include ethics of cooperation and solidarity. These, prim these principles take worker cooperatives beyond the individual enterprises to create flows of mutuality, solidarity, and economic exchanges with other cooperatives. In linking up with communities um, and social movements, they also take on broader issues such as the environment, social issues, and developmental issues. So in, ca in contrast to capitalist enterprises that put profits at the center and work through hierarchies, worker cooperatives today, genuine worker cooperatives today, place human needs at the center of their activities. Even if they have to make profits to survive, um, profits are a means to an end. They're not the end in themselves. And so the point is that profits for cooperatives are not the primary goal. Um, and I think Mondragon's insistence that capital is at the service of labor, capital is at the service of labor, um, rather than the capitalist formula, which is that labor is at the service of capital, uh, is an example of a cooperative system placing human needs at the center of organization, the Mondragon example of labor, um, capital is at the service of labor. Many worker cooperatives are practicing, without naming it, um, the idea of the commons. And I think, actually, it's fantastic she just walked in. Hilary Wainwright's work helps <laughs> us understand um, this when she highlights the central role of workers' um, creative capacity in envisioning and creating alternatives. Through their collective creative capacity, worker cooperatives are re-embedding economic activity into the social realm. They are re-embedding the economy in, which, in the larger social relations. And in this collective process, the idea of the commons is vital. And the commons comes out of struggles against processes, of, uh, processes to commodify resources that have previously been um, held in common. And so worker cooperatives are engendering creative labor commons through their individual and collective creativity. And I think this is really well demonstrated, again, by Mondragon's um, knowledge commons. They have a knowledge commons. They have research and development centers. And they have education and training programs that are all about common education, common knowledge, indigenous knowledge um, that kind of gets at this creative labor com commons. What we're also seeing in worker cooperatives is that they do not primarily focus on activities they're, they're, they do not primarily focus their activities on defensive protests or disruptive protests, but rather are engaged in creative forms of resistance through prefiguratively building alternatives. So for worker cooperatives, this, the idea of symbolic power, not just structural movement or direct power, um, is increasingly important. And by symbolic power, we mean struggles that are, firm, that are framed in such a way that wins broader um, support from the public, even for issues that might not directly affect this public. So symbolic power seeks to build legitimacy, both moral and discursive legitimacy, and it's in the realm of the public. The law obviously can facilitate this, but moral legitimacy is crucial in what they're after. So we see this in the recovered factories in Argentina, where the cooperatives consciously build links with communities. They made films and hosted concerts. They, they run <coughs> exchange visits in the cooperatives, all in an effort to gain public support and legit legitimacy for their struggle. This symbolic power also facilitated emergence of solidarity economy relations. In this process, classification struggles to define legit legitimacy are vital. For Bardu, it is the elite and the state who engage in classification struggles. What we are suggesting is that worker cooperatives are also engaging in classification <coughs> struggles that redefine the way work is organized, who a worker is, 
um, who makes decisions, the nature of work, and very important for our work, what constitutes an economy. So there is um, classification struggles from below, and Bordeaux's work is all about classification struggles from above and that they don't happen from below. And what we're seeing is that they're actually happening from below as well. Okay, so what I said is that um, what is especially noteworthy in today's experiences is that they're sealing, um, that is that they're scaling up these isolated individual cooperative experiences is what we've seen over the last 150 years, but they're scaling this up now into solidarity economies, which Fish is going to talk more about. Um, now I'm going to focus on a few empirical cases to flesh out some of these ideas and just to give you a sense of some of the empirical. Um, so we decided there's been a lot of work done on Mondragon and the Argentinian um, factory, recovered factories. So we're, there are cases that we have also in the book, but we're not going to talk about them today. We chose less well-known cases to give you some exposure to other places. Um, because of time, they're necessarily brief and just sketches of these places, but we're, well, we're happy to um, elaborate more in the, in the questions. Okay. So now we're talking about pathways, basically worker cooperative pathways to solidarity economies. Case number one, Seco Sassola in Barquisimento, Venezuela, perhaps best captures the importance of creating uh, an alternative cultural value system that is engaging in classification <laughs> struggles um, in an effort to build solidarity economy linkages. Seca Sassola started in the 1970s as a worker cooperative of 480 people that holds weekly cooperative markets. Uh, they link up with cooperative network uh, system that brings together agricultural producer cooperatives in the rural areas around, uh, around Barquisimento to the urban-based worker cooperatives. And in this process, they've created a, a cooperative movement um, that includes clinics, laboratories for blood tests, insurance, savings and loans, a hospital, and other cooperative markets, so that throughout the entire um, city, there's these cooperative markets. So today, there are 60, 60 organizations, 20,000 members, and 1,000 worker owners who together make up a thick network of the Secasasola system. It has pioneered a processual understanding of individual, collective, and organizational creative learning based on trust and mutual cooperation. It spends a great deal of its time making decisions, and all decisions are made collectively. This is just a schematic pro um, uh, diagram to try to show what they, um, all the different types of overlapping decision making. So they start. Um, They've, they basically have all, all the different decisions get first made in small groups and they scale up to a collective bigger group. So it's a very much process. It takes a lot of time, but they value this a lot. And they've nurtured values and a culture of solidarity and trust and self and collective growth and, and caring and sharing. And these are the adjectives that they would use to describe themselves. It has also helped to create a solidarity economy among the cooperatives. And this is really vividly demonstrated in the 2003 food crisis that Venezuela experienced. Barquisimento was the only region of Venezuela that did not have food, a food crisis. It actually um, was basically food secure throughout the entire food crisis, in large part because of Seca Sosola cooperative network being able to feed people and not letting people hoard and making sure that they got food out to the necessary areas. So Seca Sosola demonstrates um, the solidarity economy's success in redefining work and economic relations based on human needs, solidarity, and trust, as well as building a locally based regional network of production, consumption, and finance based on popular ownership and control through democratic dis uh, principles of self-management. So it shows the solidarity economy moving beyond isolated cooperatives. It's not just these markets, but actually m m making, uh, scaling up into a movement based on interconnections and networks and basically creating solidarity economy act, um, linkages. My second case is, um, demonstrates a thick network of different cooperatives transforming both political and economic relations. So the Trentino Cooperative Movement in, northern in the northern Italian province of Trentino is an excellent example of a 100-year-old movement creating a network of alternative forms of production, consumption, and finance. Finance is always crucial, what we've found. It's vital for solidarity economies to um, emerge and thrive. Trentino is home to 600 cooperatives in 20 223 villages. Um, over 235,000 people are members of cooperatives, which is 50% of the population, so there's a very dense presence of cooperatives. 
There are 23,000 worker owners and 293 cooperatives, 21,000 um, members, uh, farmers in 101 cooperatives, 82,000 retail members, 108,000 members of banks. And what's interesting in the 2008 crisis, they were not affected at all because they don't, they never engaged the kind of financial markets that um, most other banks, so they actually were secure and they had solid um, investments throughout the period, so solid returns. Not over the top, but solid. Um, so uh, over 80% 80, 80 of land in Trentino is f owned and farmed collectively. So the strength of the cooperative hits you at every turn. And what is interesting about Trentino is that it shows the importance of cooperative banks and cooperative supermarkets in creating pathways to the solidarity economy. Worker cooperatives are, are important, but they're just one aspect of it. Um, in every village square, there are two central institutions, where there are actually three, but we focus on two. The two that we focus on are the cooperative bank and the cooperative store. The third one is the church, um, but we weren't studying the church. Um, and over 60% of its products, the, the store, 60% of its products are sourced from the cooperatives in the region. The cooperatives feature in every sector of the economy. For example, 90% of agricultural Agriculture consumed in the main town of Trento is produced by the cooperatives in the region. That's 90%. Um, there are 69 banks with 341 branches that provide 60% of total credit in the province. And there's a central cooperative wholesaler that supplies the local cooperative shops and 38% of uh, consumer goods are sold through cooperative stores. There's also, um, th through the shops, 8% of all local cooperative uh, agricultural produce, um, including wine and cheese, is sold. So, and the rest is exported to Italy and abroad. Um, and so, like many cooperatives, the cooperative movement originally framed, uh, formed due to dire poverty in the region, but now, 100 years ago, now Trentino is one of the wealthiest regions of Italy with the lowest, some of the lowest inequality, and what's interesting is the cleanest government in Italy as well. And they think it has something directly to do with the cooperative and the kind of vibrancy of, of the population in, in Trentino. Um, so central to its, its success has been creating alternative values that challenge capitalism's dominant values of competition and possessive individualism and allowed it to develop solidarity economy net, um, relations. From its very beginning, it believed that cooperation is a universal value and insisted on tolerance and openness to all social, religious, and political formations. Okay, now I turn to my third case that demonstrates solidarity, democratic decision making, a culture of sharing, and commitment to community development. How am I? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, in the southern state of Kerala, India, there is a remarkable 90 year old worker owned cooperative that is the oldest worker cooperative in India. Eurolungal Labor Contract Cooperative Society is a 2,000 member strong worker owned and worker controlled construction cooperative that has completed over 3,700 3, large infrastructural projects such as roads, bridges, and building complexes. Um, Eurolungal has pioneered local level alternatives, production, alternative production, and epitomizes many of the qualities of the solidarity economy. These principles are encoded in the fabric of the cooperative, and the primary objective of the cooperative is to service the interests of its members through secure, rewarding, and well remunerated work, but also to provide a service to the community through its public infrastructural projects. To do this, it has pioneered democratic workplace organization, egalitarian redistribution, ecological approaches to resources, and symbolic power in relationship to the state. At the center of its success is a commitment to participatory and direct democracy. At, and, and this, you really have to appreciate, is not something easy to maintain over 90 years and also such a complex um, organization that at any given time, it has 80 construction sites happening simultaneously which could lead to the erosion of, of democratic decision making. But it's worked very hard to not let this happen. So what it does at every um, construction site at the beginning of a project, the workers elect a site leader. They have site meetings every day. The site, all the site leaders at all 80 construction um, centers meet every afternoon with the board. And then there's weekly meetings and then there's monthly meetings with all the workers. So there's a constant process of democratic spaces for there to be real input. 
and interesting, all board members have to be construction workers and have to, they get assigned to a, a construction site and have to work at least one day a week at the construction site. So they're very much linked to the construction process. The approach to the environment is really interesting with Eurolingal, as it decided early on that it needed to own its own land to use in the construction process so it can mine quarries and um, have a, many of the, the important inputs for construction. But what it does, it has constant environmental impact assessments on its own land, and when the land gets to a certain point, it turns them into plantations, which it uses then to plant food that it feeds the 2,000 members of the cooperative, and the, the chefs are members of the cooperative as well. Um, so it feeds breakfast and lunch to all members, but it also then provides food to local schools, and it has the added advantage that it actually greens the quarries after they've been mined. Um, it is also very aware of the importance of providing good public works. It feels this is one of the things it provides to the community. It's in a highly competitive and corrupt sector, um, and it's had 90 years of basically clean audits and no corruption, but it also doesn't do the things that private contractors do of uh, minimizing wages and cheating on materials. It, it, it sees its responsibilities to good public, tra uh, public infrastructure as sacrosanct. And so its assets or its competitive edge, what it would argue, is that it has higher labor productivity. And this is because it has really good, skilled, committed workers who are committed to finishing jobs on time but also to not wasting resources such as tar, metal, cement and their cooperative, um, cooperative successful completion of projects on time is in large part because of the workers themselves. So the cooperative says that its commitment of worker owners and not simply supervisors or managers is a major asset of the cooperative. The cooperative also exemplifies principles of solidarity economy when it comes to the community development in the rural areas. Um, it has, it, because it owns quarries, what it's also done is been able to use its raw materials to build rural schools that would normally, not, rural schools, rural roads, <coughs> um, distribution stores, old age homes, community centers, and these are things that normally wouldn't be built or they wouldn't have access to. So it's built a lot of these things just in terms of giving back to communities and making sure they have the needs that they, they need. Um, so your Lungal Cooperative provides an excellent example of principles of solidarity, democratic decision making, culture of sharing, and commitment of community development. I didn't talk about all of those because I don't have time, but take my word, it does demonstrate these. Um, so these examples demonstrate particular worker cooperative pathways to solidarity economy. They're, they're different. All of them are prefigurative practice, practices involving new forms of power, the reproduction of the commons, and democratic self-management. So they re represent crucial alternatives within contemporary transformative politics that Vish will now talk about. Um, well, thank you to all of you for coming and braving the cold. Um, but also thank you to the students for occupying and pushing back austerity. That's what's happening at our university as well. My students are on the march. Well done. Um, Thank you to Faisi and Alfredo as well for having us and organizing, but also thank you to the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation that funded this research project and wants the book. So um, I'm just going to say um, a little bit about transformative politics and solidarity economies and try to situate the empirical. I mean, what's at stake in what we are trying to do? Um, the first issue is about um, what it means to be anti-capitalist today. What is the identity? of an anti-capitalist. What do anti-capitalists stand for? The other issue at stake is ontological. I mean, in capitalist reality, where do we look? Where do we understand change? Uh, is it within the interstices of capitalism? Is it outside of capitalism? The third issue, of course, is um, how do we defeat this thing? Is, is it possible? Okay? It is so interpolated with who we are. It um, shapes our desires, our dreams. Uh, we are dependent on it, and so on. Uh, can we beat this thing? Okay, so these are some of the issues that are at stake here. Now, I just want to just briefly digress to say something about uh, where this, this project comes from. Uh, I know Latin America has gained a lot of attention um, with the rise of an institutional left, the powerful social movements, but this project comes from Africa. Okay? It comes from an attempt to rethink alternatives, rethink 
the post-national liberation left in the African context. Uh, this is an earlier book on the solidarity economy, uh, reflecting on practice also from different parts of the world that we've worked on. Hillary was one of the contributors to that book. Uh, the Democratic Marxism series, um, which I edit and which comes out of South Africa, uh, this is the second volume, um, is an attempt to also rethink and renew uh, Marxist left and anti-capitalist perspectives. Uh, the other place this all derives from and emerges from is, is, pra is, is practice. Um, these are activists from the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign founded by the Solidarity Economy Network in South Africa protesting outside our stock exchange and telling food corporations to leave our food system. They want space for another pathway. So what are solidarity economies? Um, there are two ways of answering this question, and the one is historical. Um, in the 19th century, um, we saw the emergence of modern cooperatives. Here in the UK, you have the Rochdale pioneers. Um, in the time of uh, <coughs> the Paris Commune, you also saw the emergence of worker cooperatives, and so on. Um, but in that history, in the 19th century, there were two tendencies. There was an ameliorative tendency, and there was also a transformative tendency that was reaching for something more. But there are also national histories that help us appreciate um, the emergence of solidarity economies. Uh, in, in Brazil, from what we've learned, it was runaway slaves that pioneered solidarity in communities. In my own country, um, mine workers uh, in the 19th century formed burial societies mm -hmm. to get dead mine workers back to rural communities, and they used solidarity for that. The other thing about um, Solidarity economies is that they are contingent anti-capitalist practices. Um, Paul Singer from Brazil talks about an alternative mode of production. Um, it translates differently in different contexts. Um, we talk about people's economies, at least during the military dictatorships in Latin America, that was the language used. It's also, it's also referred to um, as alternative economies and alternative civilization and so on. But it's in the making, it's in process, it's in the state of becoming, it is not a blueprint, it is not finished, and I think that's very, very important for us to keep in mind. It's, it's, it's located in context, in conditions, and in agency. It's about spaces within capitalism, so you know, if you really look around us, there are non-capitalist practices and logics and so on at work. It is also outside capitalism. And, you know, we're living on a planet of slums. Uh, feminism has taught us, you know, the invisibility of household labor, all outside capitalism. There's a lot of stuff outside of capitalism. And solidarity economies are taking root in these spaces. There are also systemic alternatives that are based on values and institutionalizing values. The left of the 20th century, I believe, hasn't got it right to build institutions, okay? Alternative institutions. And I think if we, if, we, if we look at the cases and we look at what has been achieved, it's really about a new pattern and logic of production, consumption, and spatial ordering, and so on. So there are different institutional forms that come together inside the solidarity economy. And this ranges from worker cooperatives, barter clubs, cooperative banks, communal land associations, community trusts, rotating savings clubs, and so on. So a variegated kind of um, set of institutions. Now, <coughs> where does transformative uh, politics come from? Well, I'm glad Hillary is here because she's been one of the people that's been pioneering this idea. When I worked for the labor movement in South Africa, um, one of the first books I read was on Lucas Aerospace. And then subsequently I read a book on arguments for a new left and realized that transformative politics was linked to union politics and the search for alternatives. So it's an idea that emerges in the context of the global restructuring of capitalism. And you know, we know the sins and we know the contradictions, and I'm not going to belabor it in this audience. Financialization, commodification, regimes of primitive accumulation, and so on. So it, it, it actually is something that is articulated and expresses itself in the counter-movement to all of this, in the cycle of resistance that has also accompanied um, the global neoliberal restructuring. And different people punctuate the cycle differently. Uh, I start in the Caracazo in Venezuela in 1989, and then of course 94, the Zapatistas, 99, the rise of transnational activism, 2001, uh, World Social Forum, and then 2011, very, very important punctuation point in the cycle of resistance. But in all of this, what we've seen 
is an, uh, is an expression, an articulation of alternatives, systemic alternatives. Participatory democracy, food sovereignty, climate justice, socially owned renewables, degrowth, uh, universal basic income grant, climate jobs, right to information, the deglobalizing of finance. I mean, when all is said and done, I mean, this basically means we can have a better world. And a, and a better society and a better civilization than what we have. And these alternatives have, have come to the fore. And solidarity economies and worker cooperatives are one of these systemic alternatives. Now, sorry, it's important for us to keep in mind a few distinctions because on the horizon are also competing narratives and propositions that are ameliorative. And there are three I just want to spend some time on. The first is philanthropy. And, you know, we've seen the rise of billionaires and foundations and so on. And, of course, um, the old anthropological idea of gifting and giving. But even notions of horizontal giving um, have been brandished and presented to us as one way forward. <coughs> Uh, a more human face to things. The other is the social economy, but again, I must use it in a very guarded way, because in Europe, social economy has particular inflections uh, in and, 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 and in the north, um, like in Quebec. I would argue it's much more solidarity economy, but the language of social economy is used. But in the context of uh, neoliberal restructuring, social economy is considered a residual third sector, very much functional uh, to the logic of capital. And then, of course, there's a localization discourse. Um, your transition towns in the UK. So you aggregate all these little alternatives and you have one big alternative. But localization discourses are blind to power. They are blind to class and so on. So, um, I always keep on getting this wrong. So, <laughs> the new anti-capitalism that's emerging is very, very important um, for how we think about transformative politics. It's very much post-vanguardist. And when I talk about post-vanguardist, I mean it's very different from the Sovietized, centralized monopoly of power that was there in communist parties in the 20th century. It's very different from national liberation movements and the patronage machines they developed. But it's also very different from the technocratic practices of social democratic parties. It's also not state-centric. Um, there's, there's clearly a different understanding of power. Power is not sitting in some building, you smash the building and then you rebuild. Um, there's a very sophisticated understanding of how power works in the new anti-capitalism and you've got to constitute power. Different forms of power that Mich Michelle spoke to, uh, symbolic, movement, um, structural, etc. Uh, it's deeply anti-authoritarian, and there's an awareness of process, there's an awareness of how we deliberate and how we make decisions, and it's, it's actually living the alternative now. There's a utopian imagination at work, and, you know, and this is not utopia in the idealistic sense or in the, in the derisive sense. It's a utopian imagination that is looking at historical material possibilities in the here and now for us to move forward in a different direction different pathway. Um, and then, of course, the subject of history is a big issue in the new anti-capitalism. Uh, is it the precariat? Uh, is it the outsiders of capitalism? And I think in this project that we are journeying on, we are increasingly leaning towards the notion of the outsiders of capitalism um, as the subject of history. Um, the millions that are living in the planet of slums, the unemployed, and so on, the permanently unemployed that are never going to get jobs again. So solidarity economies and worker cooperatives are located uh, within the new anti-capitalism and this new imagination and conception of, of politics. It is, it is <clears throat> a transformative politics um, that is also anchored in a very important premise, that capitalism today has reached a historically unprecedented place. It is experiencing uh, systemic crises of accumulation. Now, generally, we think that capitalism has all the fixes. It is flexible, it is adaptable, and it wins all the time. But given what is converging today in the gridlock of financialized chaos, which is systemic, climate change, oil peak, food crises, securitization, and hollowing out of democracy, capital today is a geological force. It is shaping everything, all the conditions of life on planet Earth. But it is driven by a systemic logic of imperial ecocide. In other words, it's destroying everything at the same time. It's undercutting itself. 
And I think this is a very, very important premise for transformative politics as anti-capitalist, but also systemic politics. But I don't want to talk about it as though this is catastrophism, that it's all going to come to a grand end, or on the other hand, that it's just going to fall flat and something new is going to come out of that. It's clearly going to be around, uh, and it's resilient, and it's, and it's strong in some ways and weak in other ways, but it's clearly, um, I would argue, in the end game stage of capitalism, which further underpins and underlines the imperative of building systemic alternatives to exit the systemic contradictions that are there, that are part of this logic of ecocide, of destruction of everything. So the crux of transformative politics is the banner slogan, system change, or systemic <coughs> reforms. So we are really in the interstices, in the, in the interstitial spaces, in the outside of capitalism, building something different. This is my last slide. Um, so what does this mean concretely? What are the strategies of transformative politics? And, and Alfredo and I were having this exchange about the dead end of the PT and the ANC in South Africa. And, and what is it? Is it still about reform versus revolution? Which was very much the 20th century meme, the idea of what left politics is all about. Uh, reform has reached its limits and it's been assimilated into neoliberalism. Um, Revolution has a lot to answer for. You know, we produced a lot of tyrannies uh, through this kind of politics. Uh, it has to reflect in a self-reflexive way about its own horrors and so on. So we are talking about a different kind of politics. Um, and it's a politics that's transitional. It relates to, to us going beyond capitalism and really rethinking another way of sustaining life a logic to sustain life, a post-productivism. So it's not just growth, and it's not just endless accumulation, and so on. But what are the strategies um, to get us there? So very quickly, four strategies of transformative politics in which we locate um, solidarity economies and particularly worker cooperatives. The first strategy is to build from outside of capitalism. And this is where food sovereignty economies become important. Uh, in the context of the society I come from, where 14 million people go to bed hungry, if you build a food sovereignty economy in a township community that is uh, about producers controlling that economy and consumers controlling that food economy, you are building something that's alternative um, to a corporate control food system. It's outside of capitalism. You're building worker cooperatives um, outside of capitalism amongst the unemployed, uh, socially owned renewables uh, coming together in communities and, and putting up their own infrastructure and their own um, uh, renewable um, technologies, the cyber commons. These are all practices and these are all systemic alternatives that can be built from outside of capitalism. We can build from within capitalism and go beyond capitalism. So this is another transformative strategy. strategy. Worker-run factories in Argentina are uh, uh, symbolic and, and represent um, this kind of strategy. So we were there in October recently, our third visit, and we were in a workshop with uh, various people. And the number of worker-run factories has grown um, to 300 now in the context of the 2008 crisis hitting Argentina and so on. Uh, in 2001, there were about 200 worker-run factories. And they are more networked, they are more connected, and so on. Reclaiming the public university. So what you are trying to do here, what the students at my university are trying to do with the fees must fall movement, reclaiming the public university is building from within and going beyond capitalism. Okay. Uh, cooperative banks, another example of that, where you deglobalize finance and you, and you relocate it in the hands of, of, of members. And then, of course, the third strategy is pushing back capitalism from above. And I'm sorry to my anarchist friends, I still think the state is important. And I do think that the state, uh, particularly the state that's being remade in the context of Latin America, the new constitutionalism we've seen in Ecuador, for example, in which there's green citizenship, there are ecological rights, and so on. These things are also very, very important to push back capitalism alongside um, first and second generation rights, civil and political rights, and socio-economic rights, and so on. These are very, very important. Um, participatory planning and bringing the state in to play that role. So in Kerala, a lot of decentralized budgeting going on in villages, etc., which have enabled this undergrowth of amazing cooperatives, including enabling and facilitating Urulangal's work. 
Regulation is very, very important. Uh, worker cooperative laws are important. Uh, cooperative bank laws are important. Um, laws to demarcate spaces for a solidarity market. When we were in Brazil a few years ago, activists were talking about, well, we have fair trade, but we want our own market inside Brazil for the solidarity economy. And then, of course, the last and final strategy is transnational solidarity. And this is really about movement to movement exchanges. So in all the world social forum spaces we've sat in and learned from, um, there have been many, many exchanges uh, of ideas on practice, on theory, on concepts, and diffusion happening uh, in this way between movements. Um, and then, of course, state to movement relationships. Um, when the worker-run factories emerge in Argentina and then eventually when Chavez rises in Venezuela, um, what's interesting is that uh, the Chavistas invite the worker-run factories to come to Venezuela. And they have numerous exchanges uh, around what's happening in worker-run factories to learn lessons, to draw them out for, uh, for their own project. But having said all of this, there are still massive challenges and there are limits um, around all of this, which I'm not going to get into. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Michelle and Vishbash, for uh, this very uh, theoretically and politically inspiring talk. We now look forward to reading your book and to sharing it with our students, so let us know when it's finished. Um, I will now open the floor to your questions. We will take rounds of three and we will give them the chance to answer. Please. One there. Two. And three, fine. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's very inspiring. Um, so, my question is really about that. There's a lot of things you are uh, mentioning that you might gain from such a, uh, <coughs> a solidarity economy, the type of um, social justice, type of democracy that would uh, not lead to more equality and stuff like that. But uh, I wonder if you've also thought about this thing you might lose by stepping away from a capitalist type of economy, such as um, high food productivity, um, looking at a global population crisis, for example. Or uh, an example that I just came up with, like uh, pharmaceuticals, for example. Um, the, I mean, I'm far from defending the pharmaceutical industry as it is at this point, but it takes a lot of capital to develop a type of drug that helps uh, you know, putting out how, how, how would you um, tackle this kind of problem here? Okay, there is a request here for people to introduce themselves before uh, you ask your question, so please if you can say who you are. Uh, where was the second? Here. Uh, hi, my name is Jared uh, Saras. Um, I was just wondering uh, what your thoughts were on the, the idea that so much emphasis on worker cooperatives, do you not feel that they can sometimes fall victim to kind of small-minded thinking and very much their own needs and wants are really only those focused on those that they work with and they're kind of geographically kind of situated there as well than kind of looking beyond the workplace. Um. Hi, my name is Sofa. Um, I think that the idea of in fact, I just had my viva this morning. Congrats. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I was very to this, actually, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, I have a question for Michelle. Um, as I understood it, you, you were describing a shift, some kind of shift in, or, or maybe I misinterpreted you, I'm not sure, um, in either the cooperative movement or the cooperative movement literature towards some kind of increasing politicization or solidaritification or something like that. Um, so my question is, is that shift within uh, co-op theory or within the co-op movement, if there is if there is one, and what might have caused this shift? Um, is is it a kind of is it a case that co-ops are organising more uh, and have coordinated the shift, or is is it just a trend that you've observed? Please, we can start answering these three. Oh, sorry, please. Okay. Um, 
So why don't I do a pharmaceutical? Okay, I'll go back first. Okay. Um, we're not really going to divide. We'll just speak to whatever. Um, so the first thing about l what you might lose, um, I'll let Vish speak more to that. But I was just, the pharmaceutical is a good example of how very large, very wealthy corporations control it, and it doesn't actually get to a lot of people. I mean, we know that in the global south very much. Um, and I think that Taiwan is a great example of a state that tried to actually get involved, and they ended up becoming kind of the research and development wing of these major corporations because they just couldn't break into this. So I mean, I think that what you would, something like that would actually require very strong state involvement and probably wouldn't be done by worker co-ops, but actually would be. So uh, this is where, I mean, Vish was saying the state is still important. There's these mixes. Um, and I think that, you know, but it doesn't have to be based on capitalist relations necessarily. Um, and I think, I think Taiwan's experience actually really captures what's wrong with it and how hard it is to get in. And then the global south, the end users who don't get it unless we just make illegal um, uh, generics. Okay, um, on uh, can worker cooperatives fall victim of small-mindedness? I mean, that's an interesting thing. So what we've seen is I mean, that's, that's certainly kind of the shift that I was trying to describe, and it w definitely was a shift, is that historically they very much were about their isolated enterprises at the point of production. And what we're seeing now is they're realizing to survive, they need to be more than that. Um, I mean, Mondragon made this point very strongly because, you know, they've been critiqued often that they're still operating within a capitalist economy and stuff, and they were saying, you know, every linkage we can we make you know give us alternative economies we're trying and but they're very mu they're very aware of this it's not to say every single co-op we uh, you know we we interviewed over 300 people and went to over 100 co-ops um, so there were some that were more inward looking but it was quite extraordinary how many actually were making linkages beyond their own isolated enterprises I mean that's what we empirically found and that goes directly into um, Sofa's question this is I said at the beginning that our theoretical work is very much in um, engagement with our empirical this is what we saw it's not in co-op theory it's actually what we saw concretely and at first we we weren't sure what to make out of it, but there is this shift. I mean, and they are talking. I mean, I mean, maybe this is a positive side of kind of globalized relations. But there's very much an awareness that they need to actually make these linkages. They need to embed the economy in larger social relations. Um, so it was. It's completely out of the empirical work that we, we're theorizing these things. Um, I mean, just on the point of inward looking, um, cooperatives by themselves as little islands. Um, they can degenerate very easily, or they can try and maintain some kind of survivalist presence um, in difficult situations. Um, but I think what we've been learning from the empirical and from the practices that we've observed is that the moment they start um, reaching out, replicating, uh, the moment they start working with others, networking, and so on, a completely different logic takes over. Um, now, you, you know, if, if these are serious cooperatives, it's, it will be inbuilt into the DNA of how they function. They wouldn't just be inward looking. They would look to make connections and so on. And, and that's very crucial to the, so, to the solidarity economy. Um, the, the point about um, what we lose uh, with capitalism, I mean, I, I think there's two sets of issues here. I mean, the one is we all have to come to terms with the ecological limits of capitalism today. And, and, and that means existentially, we really have to ask some very serious questions about the quality of life, um, what is a good life, what is a happy life. Um, the progress and the wealth that's been achieved of capitalism um, cannot be reproduced in the same kind of way. Um, so that's, that's one big issue. Um, the, the, the other issue uh, that we have to grapple with is that, I mean, we are not arguing for an anti-technology view, or we are not arguing against um, institutional progress and so on. Um, I mean, not everything in capitalism uh, belongs to capitalism. So l let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, the displacement of um, indigenous agroecological uh, farming is a very serious battle line on the planet right now. And what's happening there is that despite the expansion of transnational agriculture and so on, you still have a billion people that are hungry, two billion 
food insecure despite the high yields and the expansion of this, this Frankenstein. On the other hand, you have um, indigenous uh, farmers in like La Via Campesina, 200 million peasants and so on, who are protecting uh, biotic resources, their seeds, etc. And in that way, they are continuing to feed um, almost two-thirds of the world's population. So in Africa, for example, we have a food policy group at, at the university, um, and we've been looking at, at how food economies work in Africa. It's amazing, uh, just north of the Limpopo, uh, most major towns and cities are actually fed by small-scale farmers in Africa. Okay. And, and, but yet, of course, you know, the retail uh, chains are coming in, the large corporations are coming in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I, I think there's something to think about there um, and, and how we go forward. Yeah. Okay, so Alessandra, so three, and then another round, please. Alessandra, thank you so much. That was quite inspiring. <coughs> And I hope we'll bring back uh, our message of solidarity to your student movement that's been greatly inspired for us, as well as the one in Delhi and in so many other places. I guess my question relates to uh, knowing a bit more about some of the cases you sketched in terms of particularly the political conditions, initial conditions, mm -hmm. that you feel they're just uh, uh, set the terrain for some uh, experiments to be successful and some others instead not. And I'm thinking about the Trento case in Italy and myself. It's a region that is flooded with money because it's what we call special statu uh, statute region, mm -hmm. which, you know, we try to, build, to buy off by border areas that mm -hmm. wanted to belong to another state uh, in a mm -hmm. nutshell by just uh, inflating a huge amount of money that went in different places. So I'm not surprised that you will have this. Um, and so, in a sense, which are the political conditions in your own work that you find are more conducive than others that perhaps we have to go to look outside the cooperative experiment itself? And related to this, when you talk about the different institutions that are crucial for a cooperative, I'm wondering also if we can also say something about the desirability or lack of desirability of different institutions, because again, you did not mention the church, but we shall mention the church, mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. of course, that is uh, in terms of the exclusionary politics that then can permeate certain cooperatives that might even have an anti-capitalist message, but still are built on uh, institutions that, although informal, might still not be up for a progressive politics. So I wonder, in your different cases, what you can say about diversity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah, PhD student economist. Yeah. Um, my two short questions. First is related to my question. Uh, what's the relation between leftist organizations, political parties, and these cooperatives? Like, what are the most interesting examples? I mean, I know um, a Communist Party wouldn't pioneer a hundred years old cooperative, but for instance, in Venezuela, was there a relation between them? Also, in terms of in, in like influence, did uh, this cooperative influence the like political perception of the population there? And the second question is about like uh, workers who are not traditionally understood workers, but they have uh, cooperatives. For instance, as far as I know, there is a big cooperative in India uh, from waste pickers. Mm. Like, um, and this is a like interesting um, example. Do you think? It can be held in similar ways, or they have their own uh, characteristics. Okay. Hi, I'm Sarah. I work in the economic justice policy. Um, and I was interested in hearing your thoughts on what role do you think that the traditional development sector, donors, NGOs, what role could they play in reimagining and, and yeah? And doing something new, something different in this space. Okay. Should I make Okay. Um, okay, great. All great questions. Um, partly why I chose the three cases is to show that they're very different political terrains. So there's not one, I mean, Vish said, there's no blueprint. Um, and so we see it in variety. I mean, what's interesting about Trentino, it wasn't the wealthiest province when it formed. It was the poorest a hundred years ago. It was, um, you know, it was actually um, widespread dire poverty. I mean, it, it's interesting. We see 
co-ops and solidarity economy linkages coming from two sectors. One, it's either survivalist, what we see often in Africa, but and then often in the global north, especially in the last 40 years, um, what you see are kind of middle class peoples who want an alternative life. So you see those two. But Trentino, and just like the Basque country, they actually were poor when they started. So it actually might help explain some of the dynamics today, but it doesn't help explain its emergence. Um, but that doesn't really get to the conditions that you're asking. And I, I think that what we saw is that there, there's a huge variety, and this links to your question as well, that you know some are actually able to work with the state. When we were just in Argentina, we were, we were very surprised to see that the worker-run um, factories have been able to actually push the state to provide some kind of supportive mechanisms. And for example, one of the things that they did, um, unions for had had won a a kind of condition or concession from the state that instead of laying off workers in factories, that the state would then help companies in distress by giving them six months to a year wages rather than laying off their workers, right? Mm -hmm. So what the worker-run factories did is they actually pressurized the state and said, hey, we need that too. So they actually got the state involved. Um, but in other places, the state has been completely out of the, um, the, the realm and hasn't been present at all. Um, in in um, Trentino, it's interesting because the state wasn't ever very involved, and it was the power, the kind of structural power of the cooperative movement that got the state to actually, they were able to pressurize the state and get the state to then be supportive, and then they, they've taken over some of the social functions of the state by social cooperatives. Um, in, I mean, I, I, the question around, um, or so, so, you know, about leftist organizations and co-ops, it's interesting. I mean, the Communist Party in Kerala, is very supportive of these kind of things. In fact, when it was in power in the, oh God, I think it was the 70s, it passed a law that basically said any of these infrastructural state projects that a cooperative bids for, if it's within 10% of the lowest bid, it has to be given the chance to compete. And it actually, the state, the local government has to give the work to the cooperative. So they've actually been able to, uh, um, they've been supportive of the cooperatives, partly because the cooperatives have actually shown, like the Eurolingual, um, as I mentioned, it hasn't had any corruption. It hasn't, it has actually delivered every, it's never not delivered on a project and has very close to on time delivery. So it has a good reputation. Um, so it's, but then you have places that the left isn't that interested. Um, you have places where, um, so Seca Sosola is an example that it completely did this outside. It started in the 70s and that was not in a progressive space in Venezuela at all. But yet they actually started building these. This is one of the examples of outside of political structures, but also in many ways outside of the main capitalist structures. It was by progressive, highly educated middle class who linked up, and this goes back to the role of the church a radical liberation theologist priest who actually had organized the rural areas into cooperatives. And it was these work, these rural producer cooperatives linking up with the progressives in the middle, in the urban areas that created the perfect kind of vortex of conditions to create an alternative local economy. Um, and that links to the role of, I mean, we, I, we said we didn't look at the church, partly because in Trentino what was very interesting is that unlike other areas of Italy, it didn't, it, from early on said we're not going to get divided between the communist aligned, the red aligned co-ops and the white, the church aligned. And they were tolerant um, of all, and they've worked positively with the church. And so many places that we've seen the church, Catholic, radical liberation theologist Catholicism has been very supportive of many of these initiatives. But it's not the church as in the Vatican, it's local priests on the ground who have been very progressive and pushing these alternatives is what we've seen. Um, I'll let Vish talk about the waste pickers um, and the development, the traditional development sector. I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. And, you know, I mean, one of the things we talk about is we focus on the solidarity economies, but we, and when we talk about, Vish had the slide that talked about transformative examples and then ameliorative. I mean, we would put these development things often in the ameliorative case, right? So they're not trying to transform capitalism, but they are trying to make, deal with the effects and negative externalities of capitalism. And that's important. That's absolutely important for the immediate term. It might not get us beyond it, but it is important for the immediate as you're building these alternatives. So, um, you know, I think it's what we've seen as it's context specific. Oxfam South Africa, I think, is more progressive than 
Oxfam UK. I don't know if there's any Oxfam UK in here. But um, what we've seen is that certainly the South African, they, I mean, they invite us. They want to hear these things. There's, you know, some space there from traditional. Um, and so I think it, it depends probably on the local conditions. And Vish probably can say more because he's worked a lot more in these spaces and against these spaces. Okay. Um, I mean, I think you've covered it. I mean, I, I think <laughs> we, were <coughs> I think NGOs, funders, and so on um, are really trying to understand um, the front line, where to position themselves, um, given the nature of crises today. Um, I mean, I was invited to a, a meeting by the, uh, the not the Bertha, not the Bertha Foundation, what's the other one? One of these big billionaires trusts. And they have a lot of money and they don't know where to put their money, basically, okay? And well, I was talking about the crises of capitalism and this is what's going on in the world, you know? And um, I don't know if that went down well, but, but these are the honest discourses we need to start having if we want to start reimagining from within those spaces. Um, the stakes are very high in the world we're living in today. Um, I mean, on the waste pickers, I mean, I think it's, it's again, context-specific. Um, we interviewed a lot of waste pickers in Brazil. Uh, we met waste pickers in Argentina. Uh, I mean, most of them have embraced the worker cooperative model. And I think how this gets institutionalized is determined by various conditions. So, you know, we've seen big, massive worker cooperatives um, that have very complex internal decision-making structures, uh, delineations of policy making and strategic decision making and complex divisions of labor and so on and so on. Yes, but, like but we've also seen much more simple ones um, and, 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 and that's been some of the life world of, of waste pickers that we've encountered. Um, I mean obviously it, it also depends on where they fit into um, the whole context of the waste value chain, mm -hmm. uh, what's going on there, the conditions, the dynamics, um, how they're able to leverage their own structural and movement power to, to, to open up spaces. Um, and lots of conflict and contestation happens there with others. Um, on, on, on the question of, of parties and movements, just to say this, that um, in the 20th century, uh, a very state-centric vision of development took hold, um, you know, whether it was national liberation or Soviet or social democratic. And in many ways, it displaced um, the autonomy of cooperatives and cooperative movements. Some of the movements we've researched kind of existed on the margins of some of that and nurtured their own identities, their own institutional capacities, and so on and so on. Um, but as we know, I mean, you know, we're living in a time now where, uh, you know, the state is being remade. Um, I mean, Africa has had over 300 structural adjustment programs, and the control of cooperative movements is gone. Uh, it's opening up different kinds of spaces for agency um, in villages, in communities in Africa, uh, and to re reshape and reimagine cooperatives, um, which takes parties, which, uh, which, which takes um, controlling influences away. Um, in, in, in Argentina, we saw a very complex situation um, from left groups raising the flag for some worker cooperatives uh, to uh, the unemployed people's, indi uh, in unemployed people's movements raising the banner on some cooperatives, trade unions, the metal workers union raising the banner on some worker run factories and so on and so on. Very complicated um, in how those relationships um, uh, unfold. So we have two rounds, <laughs> one, two, and three, and then these other questions. Please. Uh, I went to my food sovereignty, excuse me. Uh, in Venezuela, they have some uh, rural cooperatives, but the food doesn't get to the city because the distribution is controlled by capitalists. Mm. And <coughs> you know, the whole question of how much the solidarity economy like a conscious uh, recreation of the value chain, which is not a commodity chain. And it, it just seems to me that um, the whole question of food sovereignty would be a kind of, I'm very interested in what you're saying about that. I mean, are there urban groups trying to construct food sovereignty from urban situations? Mm -hmm. They go about doing this. It, that seems to me to demand a very conscious strategy rather than if you're just a, it's just us. It's got to link the city mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I have two questions. Um, the first question relates to a, a book chapter I read by you, you two, and it's quite a random.
random edited book, but it was about how cooperative movements are kind of being um, expropriated by corporate actors and by state actors. And it really resonated with me when I, I was in Rwanda when I was reading it and sort of the way in which the cooperative model has been used by the Rwandans like, to integrate people. And you see this also in terms of microfinance, sort of trying to rehabilitate the credit schemes. So I was kind of sad and puzzled by you didn't talk about that in your presentation, sort of the way in which cooperatives themselves are being restructured and reshaped. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about how, whether you see that across the board or not. And then the second question is about the relationships between, taxa uh, between cooperatives and taxation and the revenue basis of the state. Uh, when we're thinking about relationships between cooperatives and the state, you know, a battlefield is over the taxation and, and what happens to the surplus. So it'd be interesting to hear you talk about if you've seen those kinds of Thank you. Where was the third? There. Hi, Penny uh, Donnelly from the uh, London School of Economics from the Corporate University. Um, I've got a bit of a dilemma, really. I don't know what. My dilemma is this. I don't know whether you've thought about this whole new issue around new technology and job disruption. Mm. And so, mm. and if you bring that into the analysis, mm. is it threat or yeah. opportunity? for the cooperative network and the solidarity economy. Great. Okay. I'll go again. Then you'll go. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the issue on food sovereignty, you're exactly right. And that's what makes it Seco Sosola. For us, what was so exciting, it's not <coughs> well known. It's, you know, 10 hours from Car Caracas. Um, it's exactly because they linked urban cooperative markets to rural cooperative production. And they, they got rid of the, the capitalist agricultural production line in that whole process. Um, and it's success, and Seco Sosolo, what it did, instead of growing itself, it helped foster a lot of other cooperatives throughout the whole city mm -hmm. making these linkages. So there are a number of these, rather than them themselves becoming much bigger. Um, so I think, I mean, that's, that's exactly what that case tries to, and that's when we would say it's solidarity economies you know, um, when they start making those linkages. If it's just worker cooperatives in the rural areas not making the linkages, I mean, it has potential to become solidarity economies, but it's not yet solidarity economies. And so that's exactly right. That's, yay, that's what we wanted to get across. Um, so co-op actors and co-opted and reshaped by the state. You know, um, so some of our earlier work, we wrote a couple things. We wrote a popular thing where we, um, we're also showing a lot of the weaknesses and the problems. And then we were kind of disappointed to see how widely those things were cited to give examples how these things can't work. And then we thought, oh, shit, this is not what we meant. You know, we want to actually be honest and like show that there are challenges and they're very real challenges. But then we did a popular manual, which is on COPAC's co webpage, that's just about 20 successes in Africa. Look at they work, you know, trying to actually say these things do work. We've seen lots of co-optation, um, especially, I mean, Vish mentioned over 300 structural adjustment programs on the continent. What you had is you had very strong and vibrant cooperative movements in many places on the continent. And through structural adjustment, they were killed, or, or through state socialism of the post-liberation periods, they were killed. So th these two dynamics, one of the two killed almost all of them. Now they're trying to re-emerge. Um, and many, some are doing great, some are struggling. I mean, it's really hard to re-emerge in these competitive market environments that we're now in. So unless they have state support, they're not, um, they, they s often struggle. Um, but we didn't talk about that because this book isn't about that. Um, without denying that there's challenges, and we do talk about challenges, but more challenges um, around how, how linking up into these solidarity economies into transformative politics rather than the isolated individual enterprises. Um, the, I'll let Vish talk about the relation because he sat for eight years on the um, Department of Finance Cooperative, Develop Cooperative Banks Development Agency, so he can talk 
very specifically about some of your other questions. Um, yeah, the issue of new technology, it's really interesting, and it's not something we've totally come to terms with. Um, I mean, part of the exciting part is the, the commons that gets created, the cyber commons, the, the knowledge commons, and that's what we're seeing, and that's a very exciting part. Um, but, you know, what's interesting is, is Mondragon is a very good example. You, it, there's, you can see this wonderful diagram over the last 30 years as um, the manufacturing sector has mechanized and in most ca in capitalist enterprises, um, employment has gone down. In Mondragon, they've also mechanized, but employment has consistently gone up. So they've been able to still create jobs, different types of jobs. Um, but they're, they're, they're using technology not as a way to eliminate labor, but to maybe um, make them more efficient and competitive without eliminating labor. And in Kerala, the, the Eurolingo um, uh, um, Construction Cooperative, they also have been able to mechanize, and I mean, what they've had to do is retrain, but what it's meant, I mean, the co-op has been so successful that it's, you know, it's not just the, the, the second generation, they've been around 90 years, the kids now are educated. They're, they're no longer construction workers. They're engineers and architects and all sorts of things. So what the co-op has done, it's also now taken on many more functions. The board still has to be a construction worker. So it maintains worker control because they don't want the, you know, young, educated kids coming in and just dominating. But they do actually, they've used the mechanization and stuff to reskill existing, they, they um, educate existing, or also creating more functions within the cooperative itself. So that's another example where they've kind of creatively tried to engage. And this might have more to add to that. Okay. I mean, I think the technology issue is a dynamic in capitalism and, and you know, it, it does displace and so on. And, uh, and probably we're going to see more of that. Um, but I think it's in this context we, we cannot think about the solidarity economy and worker cooperatives in isolation from other systemic alternatives. I think this is where we've got to start talking about the basic income craft in our societies and so on. I mean, how do you reproduce life? Um, I mean, once you break that link on wage earning, you cannot reproduce yourself as a human being. Um, we are all wage dependent, uh, if you like. So we've got to start thinking about those kinds of things. But on the positive side, I mean, we've seen numerous instances of how, uh, and Michelle's mentioned Mondragon harnessing technology in a particular way consistent with its philosophy. But we've also seen other examples um, of how technology has been harnessed um, to ensure that, that cooperatives are more efficient and, and they're able to work better and so on. Um, I mean, in, in the U.S. context, um, we came across some very exciting cooperatives, worker-run cooperatives in the Bay Area, for example. And, and they've um, brought in um, serious technology in, in their bakeries, for example. And, um, and they've brought in web pages. They've brought in all kinds of creative social media stuff to embed, uh, to re-embed uh, those institutions. Um, so, you know, you can harness the new technology differently. It, it doesn't have to be the negative. <coughs> and the other quick point is, is that in South Africa, where we're trying to build a cooperative banking system, um, the big debates we've had is, is you know, because the banks are, are wanting to capture the unbanked, um, we've had big debates about how do we position cooperative banks in South Africa to um, work with ATMs and get onto this big IT infrastructure and so on. And we've pushed government to a point where, yes, it's going to invest so that cooperative banks in South Africa are on the ATM system in the country and so on. So, <coughs> so, 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 so all those things are, mm, are not inconsistent, if you like, uh, with dynamic, robust uh, cooperatives. Um, the taxation issue, um, I mean, I think in South Africa, again, you know, it, it comes down to... Uh, the power of capital and um, and the corporate tax rate, company tax rates. I mean, those things have been coming down consistently, and I'm sure in this country as well and other places in the world. And um, there's always been a push at the same time um, to push up tax rates for SMEs and cooperatives, and they're conflated with that, and, so, and that's been the debate in South Africa. Uh, and um, I think that um, the tax issue is important. I mean, I mean, some of the debates uh, that have been happening around local economic development also relates to how can you resource and enable and facilitate cooperatives differently. So, you know, providing spaces 
for them to incubate and emerge and find a pathway, um, providing certain resources for them. So it, it may not, so there might be financial taxation on one side, but there might be other enabling conditions that the state also creates uh, for, for dynamic emergence uh, of these institutions. Um, what else? Uh, I mean, my, my final point is that, you know, it's, the state is not just shaping cooperatives today. It's also cooperative movements themselves. Now, the mainstream cooperative movement in the world, the International Cooperative Alliance, um, um, is the voice, is the, is the platform of cooperatives in the world. It, it claims, you know, a billion people on the planet belonging to cooperatives and so on. But it is not a, um, a dynamic, um, radical cooperative movement. Um, I was invited to, to engage their scenario planning when they came to South Africa a few years ago. And my intervention was, you know, why doesn't the ICA work with La Via Campesina? Why doesn't the ICA work with the emerging climate justice movement? But I just saw in the newspaper the other day the ICA was at the World Economic Forum. Uh, you know, so, so, so there's, there's all of these issues that we also got to think about that are shaping uh, corporate life. Okay, how many we have? We will have a last, all of them. Yeah, a, a last round. So all these questions, please. The um, if you don't mind. mind. Uh, uh, the university uh, water supported water movement in Mexico. And I was just <coughs> wanting to mention really quickly two phenomena there that are really important that I was just wondering if you could help us uh, in kind of a broader context. One is across Latin America, probably, I suppose, in the world, the uh, local ownership management of water systems outside mm -hmm. of any sort of urban area. And the way that this is, you know, and they're not always called cooperatives, but this is a way that users and the local inhabitants are controlling a basic resource mm -hmm. and is a route mm -hmm. for this, you know, prefigurative process. And another one in Mexico is a phenomenon that I don't know if people know about it outside, but when the army took over the private, uh, the publicly owned electrical system in the center of the country, since then there's been a struggle on the part of that union, which has, as part of its struggle, con uh, converted itself into a cooperative and has just recently mm -hmm. gotten uh, ownership of 100 of the major workplaces and will be generating electricity oh. as a cooperative mm -hmm. in the central part of Mexico. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, and this breaks all the old left and this, you know, it just yeah. breaks a right. lot of stuff. Right. And they've done this by being incredibly out there on national issues and supporting other mm -hmm. movements mm -hmm. and just, and by working with users, electrical worker users mm -hmm. in a payment strike, mm -hmm. saying, you know, that nobody mm -hmm. has a contract to this private company that was that got there through military intervention. So I'm just wondering if these kinds of, when you're talking about the mm -hmm. new mm -hmm. new emergence of forms where we're kind of having something that's been brewing, but mm -hmm. now it's kind of breaking into new kinds of spaces with a new kind of form. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Exactly. Hillary, yeah. Uh, Hillary Lehner from Pepper, as you say, collaborator. And so, well, so it's been a brilliant talk and really taken a lot of things that I mean, think about the way forward and the example you give because you know it so well. It's so, so interesting. So my question is rather, you know, it's very sort of modest and sort of low key. And it's really to do with, it's taken up your idea of pathways and transition and transformation and the idea of potential. And, you know, I'm living now in Manhattan <coughs> Um, and I find in my daily life, I'm just having constant experiences of spaces for pathways. So, without wanting to bore you, you know, I, I my bike when I go in one to get my bike sorted, it says on the front, you know, ride a bike and be free. And this isn't just corporate branding. You say, you know, your mud guard's broken, they, they mend it, and they, they then can't do so. Oh, that's stupid. But, you know, and then they'll say slightly, not so sort of but just informally, they'll say, you know, we're work for the people, you know, and, and so, you know, it, it doesn't matter about the money. I, I haven't yet interviewed them, you know, about, about sort of where do they get their money and blah, blah, blah. Why aren't they a cooperative? But in a way, that raises the question, what, how, well, there are many other examples in that sort of social spaces, social initiatives. I mean, I wouldn't call them social enterprises, because that's got their other mm -hmm. resonance. But they're not exactly co-ops. You know, it would be mm. interesting to try and sort of assert them, but the issue raised for me, particularly in the context of 
Corbyn and the new possibilities politically there may be, you know, is what can be done now by a sort of quasi movement? It's not really the Labour Party, but there's a kind of movement to run Corbyn's momentum possibility. How can that, in some way, act to prefigure, you know, the kind of support that the state could give? So, could, you know, if I feel a bit nervous, could I try to say to momentum, look, why don't we go and talk to all these guys, get all these social initiatives, and say, well, you know, get to know more about them, um, and then also say, well, what could a Corbyn government do for what you're doing? How could it spread it? And in a sense, when you talk about kind of small-mindedness, I mean, there's two sides to small-mindedness. It's also the nature of the the wider environment, and the way you could say that a lot of the left has been itself rather if not small-minded, but rather closed mm. to mm. pathways and potentialities. Mm. Mm. And so, um, you know, this raises questions of what role for agency in bringing out potentials and clearing the space pathways. And, you know, you talked about cooperatives as pathways and as transitional. Well, what about these messy social enterprises, which are not, I mean, I don't know if you can quite categorize their class character. I mean, they, they are mostly, in some ways, probably people a bit on the outside, precarious, but with reasons to be ethical and, and want a meaning in their lives. So doing something that it's both something they're good at, whether it's bicycles or food or, you know, uh, or a software techie stuff. But it, I thought it adds up. There is a kind of generation people, young people particularly, but not just, who are you know, trying to take initiatives in their daily lives, that they're both economic and material, that are prefigurative. Mm. So what is the potential there? And what would a prefigurative political movement be like to, to enable that potential to be? And that's your mundane question. <laughs> I said, and that's your mundane question. Anybody else? Like, yeah, okay, so these are the last two. Please. Hi, I'm Shruti. I'm doing my PhD uh, here. Uh, my question is about the uh, willingness of the population. Um, it's, it's a bit of a discomfort about the way it's become a cooperative. Because if I'm not wrong, it started as a kind of uh, sangam early in the 1920s or so. It started by uh, people, some youngsters who were inspired by the teachings of an anti-caste uh, leader called Vagvedananda. Mm -hmm. So it's more coming back to the question of uh, Alessandra about the political context mm -hmm. of such a formation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in the movement from a sangam to a cooperative, uh, 
Uh, I'm just wondering what happened to the cost uh, thing. Are we mm. talking about it at all? Uh, and I, I find it quite interesting that the, st the children have not moved on to other occupations. So is, is there a kind of cost component there? Uh, what kind of mobility have they had? So I feel mm. it's, it's mm. a bit difficult to talk about uh, this as just a cooperative and disconnecting it from its history the mm -hmm. way it's going. Um, thank you for this opportunity from the uh, School of Economics. Um, so um, thank you for this inspiring talk. Uh, I was thinking about initiative coming from China and maybe saving the situation in China. So my question is, what kind of environment that would be conducive to this um, alternative initiative? So but besides the uh, political space, even the state support or existing cultural institutions um, are population ecology also play a role? So, so they say um, it's certain amount of cooperatives or alternative initiative has to be existing in a certain um, environment so that it can become a solidarity uh, movement so that it can be created to, to start to create linkages and create synergies. Uh, so if in that case, if isolated, um, can they develop, or other words, if so, if population ecology is important for this for the development of this movement, will in the near future this alternative movement be still confined to certain regions in the world? I don't know. I don't know the case in China. So I don't <laughs> Let's um, try. Okay. Um, no, the examples of Mexico, I think it's exciting. You're seeing, I mean, that's the whole idea of the commons. They, you know, Germany has also taken back ownership of electrical spaces. I didn't know about the Mexican one. Uh, we were in Mexico in 2010 or 2011, and we hadn't heard <coughs> about that. So that's very exciting. Um, and it's great to hear. And I think it's exactly the kind of things we're talking about. Um, and you know, there's other examples, socially owned renewables, which Fish talked about. I mean, that's a very popular concept in South Africa um, among you know the NUMS, the, the metal workers union, actually um, is really championing it, which is quite astounding, given that it's a union from a dirty industry, right? Mm -hmm. Manufacturing, and they're actually trying to get the government to retool and say, let us be at the forefront of socially owned renewable energy. Um, you know, the government's not really listening, but they're actually doing a lot of good stuff and trying to get the ideas out there. So there's lots of examples like that, and I think that, that's exactly what we're trying to get at. Um, Hillary, pathways, potentials, your daily spaces, um, your life is always exciting, it seems. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, you know, how to prefigure, I don't, I don't know how to answer this. I mean, I, this is a conversation we'll have over a drink, because I think it's so complicated, and I, I don't, we don't know the answers. We couldn't say how exactly for, um, movements to prefiguratively get the state to engage them. But I think actually the Solidarity Economy Forum in Brazil is instructive in this way, in that they were able to get the Brazilian state to form a Solidarity Economy Secretariat, but they said on the condition that two-thirds of the secret of the kind of membership are from the Solidarity Economy Forum, and most importantly, the secretary of the secretariat, so the director of the secretariat, they choose, not the state. And the state first felt uncomfortable about this, one, because normally the state likes to appoint its own people, and that was the condition. And they, and they chose Paul Singer as their, who comes out of the movement. And then what was very interesting, as soon as he became part of the state, they told him, okay, now don't come to our meetings because you're there, but we want, you know, we have this, we trust you. And, you know, it, so it's interesting. Um, it's engaging them, but if you're going to engage them, you've got to listen to them. Um, and I think that might be prefigurative stuff. So Vish might have more to say on that. Um, you know, I haven't really thought about the role of migration. Um, we have, I can't remember who asked that question, but uh, we, we, what we did here in many places, like in Brazil, many of the, like in Porto Alegre, many of the exciting stuff that was going on there was from early migrants from Scandinavian countries. Um, and we've seen this in various places, that there'll be links to places that had some kind of collective histories. Um, but in terms of, uh, we haven't, I don't, I don't think we've, we've actually come across a lot of these cooperative um, or, or solidarity economy enterprises that have primarily been 
or come out of issue areas of migration. Um, <coughs> yeah, so the, thanks. That's something we need to actually think more about, and I, I haven't thought about it. Bish may have. Um, this issue of trust and legitimacy and morality, on, and you know, I mean, the issue of growing on scale. I mean, I think the issue. There's two things. One about trust. That's within the cooperatives themselves. It's about trusting each other. The issue of morality and symbolic power is about getting the public out there to um, somehow align with your, with your endeavors. Um, and we haven't, from the ones we've seen, we haven't actually seen the problems that you're talking about. I mean, Seca Sosole is 20,000 members, and yet they've inc remain committed to this incredibly elaborate, laborious, processual model. You know, I mean, they said in their kind of 30 years, their record meeting lasted three weeks. Most of their meetings actually last an entire day because they won't jeopardize that. You know, I mean, it takes an incredible amount of uh, a stamina and personal growth to be able to, to engage that. But what that's, and, and middle class members definitely let go. They were not the leading lights any longer. Um, you know, so uh, uh, the examples we made, they, they've actually really been very conscious of not letting that happen. And I mean, back to the original point, we kind of self-selected what we wanted to find in this project is examples that are working, mm -hmm. not the examples that aren't working. So we eliminated those just because that's not the project we're doing, not because there's not stuff to learn from them, but rather we decided we want to actually see these pathways that are working and not the pathways that fail. So, um, you know, so partly it's just case selection that we don't have um, examples of a lot. I mean, we know they exist, but we haven't studied them, so we can't speak with any um, real authority on them. Um, yeah, you're right, but you know, no, so well, you're kind of right. It does come out of social reform, but it started as a cooperative right away. So it was actually the rat as not just social reform, it was a radical 20s of India. So it was also the radical anti colonial <coughs> movement and the anti caste movement at the same time. Um, and, and this area of Malabar, of, of Kerala. Um, was a kind of hotbed of this radicalism. So these ideas of collective ownership, these ideas of democratic decision making, of anti-casteism, they are all theas from a particular lower caste group, um, was definitely part of what they were doing. So they were partly, so, so from very early on, they saw themselves as more than just a cooperative. They were also trying to overcome these caste boundary, cl uh, class and caste boundaries. Um, and I don't think that that's, makes it any less exciting. I mean, I think that's actually quite interesting because it actually has that embedded in its kind of DNA almost. And just to be clear, the children have moved out. I mean, that's what I said, that they, they've moved out because they've been successful. But many then, you know, and, and it's led to all sorts of issues because suddenly the co-op didn't have enough workers in its community and they had to bring in, I guess this is the migrant issue, they brought in workers from the rest of India. And these guys didn't want to be members of the co-op because they're saying, no, we just want to be here for like the 10 years that we're going to be working here and then we want to go back. And then the co-op said, but you have to be members. And they're like, but we don't want to be members. So they created, and, and it's brilliant, they created new categories of membership. So they have A class, which is the people who are all the benefits of cooperative. And then the C class, which are these migrants, they get all the same financial benefits they get paid the same, they all these things, but they don't have decision-making authority around long-term planning, right? But they, for the, all their immediate, they're, they're treated as equal members, and they don't have to invest in like savings and loans to the same degree as the long-term folks, right? So, but yet they've still made sure that they have democratic decision-making around their immediate needs. So they've been actually quite extraordinary, I mean that goes back to an earlier, um, the er other question, they've been quite extraordinary at trying to make sure that they're keeping their values at the center of this. Um, and I think that their kind of progressive social space actually facilitated that, is not a uh, hindrance. And again, it goes back to the question, we've seen a plurality of emergence. We can't actually say there's one. And to us, that's hopeful. You know, if we all needed the same conditions, we probably um, wouldn't go very far. So that's a hopeful thing for us. Um, and what kind of environment is conducive to these spaces? Um, I guess that's kind of what I just said. There's lots of environments that are conducive and not conducive. Um, the U.S., which you would think is not a conducive environment, it's kind of the belly of the beast and um, not really a sensitive state to any kind of radical alternative. Um, 
and yet we've seen the most unbelievable, radical, worker-owned, controlled cooperatives in the U.S. I mean, those guys are, are unbelievable. The U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, they're thinking, and they've created solidarity economy linkages. They're thinking, they're theorizing, they, and they have just jacked up people. We've, we've just become incredible fans, and we didn't, you know, we didn't expect to find, I mean, you can hear from my accent, I'm originally from, the, from California, um, you know, I did all my education at Berkeley. I know all the co-ops there. I'm a big fan of them. But they're way beyond what I actually ever knew just as a kind of consumer of their services. Um, so that's a place that you wouldn't think. And they, they're kind of anarchists. So they think the state, and probably in their context, the state is a waste of time. They don't try to engage the state because they know they're never going to win anything from that state. But then you have other places where the state isn't as hostile, and they do engage the state. Um, you know, we flirted with the idea of trying to look at China and, you know, mm. you know, mm. <laughs> you know, we then thought about maybe Hong Kong, um, but it just, we, we, it's just China, China are, you know, try 10 books on its own, so we, we don't, we can't talk, I mean, and the, you know, the village enterprise stuff, it's too complicated for us to try to work into this project. I'll just make three quick points. Uh, thank you for flagging the Mexico example. Mm. We're constantly building up our roster of cases and alerts, our radars alert to all these different exciting Which examples. Um, because it's all beneath the surface. Um, it's all there. It's, it's happening. Um, and we need to unearth it. Um, the, the point that Hillary raised, just a quick one, Hillary, we, and, and we, we're grappling with it as we work through this book, is actually the space within social movement theory um, to really think about this kind of practice. Um, and um, and how are we going to bring that in? Um, and, and what are the conditions and, and what are the, kind of, you know, in not an abstract way too, right? Um, thinking about agency, um, but to use the empirical and, 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 and to theoretically work through that around a new way of thinking about social movement practice. I mean, how do you construct systemic alternatives from below? Um, so that's beer, drinks, later. Um, <laughs> I mean, just very quickly, final point around migration. Um, one example that, that came to mind um, was in, in Italy, in, in, in Trento, mm -hmm. what we found was a social cooperatives. And this is a new generation of cooperatives emerging in Italy. And they're really about integrating uh, migrants. Mm -hmm. um, they have a very complex membership structure. Um, they have migrants who work in them. Um, they have finance members, so people in the community who want to support the integration of migrants become finance members, and they make a financial contribution to the cooperative and build up a capital pool and help the cooperative grow and develop. Um, and they have volunteer members as well. So the volunteers come in to impart skills mm -hmm. to the migrants, mm -hmm. help train them, etc. It's a very interesting uh, example or model, if you like, um, of, 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 of bringing in migrants. Uh, but as Michelle said, wherever we went and we found these, these fascinating examples, mm -hmm. and when you do historicize them, um, it, there is a migrant connection somewhere in some of these cases. Um, and, you know, the Italian liberation theologian sitting in the mountains in Venezuela in the 70s, he wasn't carrying an AK-47, but he had his Bible, and he had a strong belief in radical change. And he came from Italy, and you know he worked with local people, and and he brought a tradition from Italy. Similarly, the agrarian uh, cooperatives in in rural America, a lot of them, the electricity cooperatives and others that we encountered, came with migrant traditions um, and diffusion and practice. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's something there that that needs to be learned from and unpacked. Yeah. Thank you. Wow, a very. Definitely an excellent, passionate debate. I'm very happy. Uh, thank you all for staying, for raising such like interesting questions. I am sure they really appreciate it. Thank you again, uh, Vish and Michelle, for uh, your accurate, for your insightful answers, but also for your time and for coming here again. We are very happy. Um, if you still want to leave your contacts to stay updated about our future events, you can uh, write them here. Uh, we will have a reception uh, uh, like upstairs. And uh, final thing, you're all warmly invited to our next event, which will be a big event after Reading Week. So on the 16th of uh, February, Tuesday. 
Uh, we will have Tariq Ali on the extreme uh, center, how the neoliberal project has reshaped the world in mm -hmm. the Brune Gallery Theater in the other building, all invited. You will be informed about it. Um, so thank you very much. Question. Thank you. Sarah. Sarah, nice to meet you. Okay.